Volatility, risk, and return, kind of all the same thing, but we're trying to parse them out a little bit differently each week on The Gray Report. If you're a multifamily investor, whether you're passive, active, you've been in the industry for a long time, you're just curious, this is the YouTube show podcast that was designed especially for you to get you all the most up-to-date information, data, research, and of course, some Original opinions from the Great Capital team. Some really interesting reports today. Um, we have a new CPI print from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We're going to be talking about inflation, what that means for the multifamily industry, commercial real estate, um, and just the rest of the economy. Um, another report from Yardy Matrix looking at a national rent report for just the entire national multifamily report for January 2023, a January report from Redfin, and then a Moody's Analytics article um, that's really interesting. Matt's got some comments about including. Exclusionary housing policies ramp up admits affordability crisis. Matt is that's comic. I am I'm I am waiting in the wings. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into it. Have a great episode. All right, everyone. Welcome back to The Report. Another great episode, man. Another great week. Another exciting yep. time for the multifamily industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to – what's – you've been out of the weather, man. Yeah. You're, you're back. Everyone's been sick a little bit. First, how are you feeling? Second, personally, how are you feeling <laughs> health-wise? Then your take on the market. Just what's that gut reaction? So uh, personally, I'm, I'm doing better. My, my voice is going to sound a little bit weird. So I apologize if people's eyes are watering mm-hmm. as they listen. Yep. Um, but in terms of the market, I, you know, I I clocked that CPI report really early. And I've been looking like every I've been seeking through the left wing news sites and the right wing news sites yeah. to find them talking about and trying to spin it their way. Mm. It is almost like the non event of the year. Yeah. I almost like didn't realize that there was a CPI print yeah, yesterday yeah. because and uh, it seems like you know people thought we'd be in a recession by now mm-hmm. like or did we have one but we should have been in one technically and you know the economy continues to grow i mean that's the thing we yeah. still have i mean we have employment is at its lowest right level that since like the 60s mm-hmm. um you know the jobless claims are like barely anything at all we just had a retail sales figure that came out very strong and again just a little bit higher cpi than we thought so on one hand good for the economy in terms of like economy looks good but on the other hand you got the federal reserve saying hey we're in this fight to yep. destroy inflation and it's not done so the all the comments of you know rates are going to be lowered by the end of the year I, I just don't see i see a soft you know softish landing but i don't think rates are coming down and that's why i said you know volatility risk and return mm-hmm. i think that you can only describe the last 18 months two years now yeah as volatile volatility brings risk and it also brings returns all relative in Mm -hmm. higher risk situations you can generate higher returns also you can generate higher losses as well it's all you know relatively equal in in a perfect market yeah the thing that I kept coming back to as I as I written, wrote these notes is like, yeah, the last eighteen months were volatile and like it, in many ways unprecedented. We're also entering a new kind of unprecedented era of high interest rates and aliens. Yeah, and and aliens and balloons. Yeah, <laughs> I can't think of a better symbol of our current environment than the balloon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, not not to get derailed, um, but. Um yeah, I mean, it's, we're given 2022. Project and what you want onto it. It means money. what you want. But um, but uh, what I what I mean again, just in, yeah. So I'm circling back. What I talk about is risk and volatility. Interest rates That's, are yep. linked to all of that. Mm-hmm. You know, the reason why we have you know lower interest rates, I and mean, there's a variety of reasons. Obviously, easy money, but it's in the Federal Reserve bring them down so low. But there was relatively little risk perceived in the economy and right now there's a higher level of risk which requires a premium Mm -hmm. people want to return them i'm going to put my money to work you've got inflation that's rising i need a return well interest rates have to rise it's risk volatility return losses it's all yeah and that's what i was thinking of when i when i was making the notes is it's been 14 years since interest rates were about this high since, yeah, yeah. and like from just pre great yeah, yeah like 2006 like right before a great GFC. yeah and you know if you also keep looking at that it's like oh every time it rises high there, there's a recession yeah and uh but but my point more is like it's 14 years is a 
is a long time. And, you know, people talk about the era of low rates. It really was an era of low rates, lower than we've ever had before. And we, I don't know how people are going to, yeah, people may remember 14 years ago, but it's going to take them a long time to get back in that mindset. And that is one of the things that I was thinking, again, about is I don't think that we are done, like markets in general, but specifically the multifamily market is done kind of mentally factoring in the uh, the higher rates that we're having right now. It's going to take a little bit of time because 14 years, you know, there's whole careers, <laughs> mine included, where I haven't seen interest rates this high. No, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's sort of a tale of two cities and multifamily. And I, I feel like that analogy is way too been overused, but it's been so true the past couple of years in a lot of different circumstances. On one hand, you know, the, looking at the fundamentals and demand for multifamily housing is, it seems like it's never been greater. You look at cost to buy a home versus renting. Um, demand from investors is 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 very high, um, but it's not high enough to where they're just getting ready to pay for anything. Mm-hmm. But there's a ton of money wanting to buy multifamily. But then on the other on the other side of that equation, we've got this you know target of the end of this year and early next year where we know all of this debt, all the CRE debt, specifically multifamily you know bridge debt and debt fund debt, is going to start to mature. And there is a high pro the conversations. Are, have been are starting now, but mm-hmm. the decisions haven't been made. Of can we refinance? Can we roll the debt? Or do we have? Yeah. Or can we get an extension from our lender? Or am I going to have to bring cash to the table? Or am I having to give the deal back to the bank? Or am I just going to have to sell it? Yeah. And based on how things trend and what happens generally in the market, you know, we could see a huge glut of properties. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at that. It's hard to say I'm excited to sell anything right now or buy anything right now when I when I know that there's an event out there yeah. that's going to affect you know pricing. Um, now, not that you can't find an opportunity that makes sense regardless. You know, if you have, if you have a long term perspective, you can make still make sense of a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but the only things that are going to get done right now, or like, you know, the only things that we're looking at, is like stuff that's off market and like very unique opportunities. Yeah, the stuff that brokers have are are properties that you know owners are like, I need to sell this. Try to you know, I saw the four caps last year. I thought about selling. I feel like I missed the boat. And then you've got a broker saying, Oh no, I can still get you a four cap, which may be true, but probably not. And um, if you if you don't. There's, I mean, I'm talking, I was talking to brokers this week, and they're like, and they want to sell properties, but they're like, I wouldn't bring a deal out right now yeah. unless you have, absolutely have to. And so, I just, it's going to be um, long term. Looks great, but we've got some stuff coming up here in the next um, two to four quarters, which also could time for a recession as well. So you know, it's going to yeah. be. Volatile, but again, you know, volatility, risk, return, the greatest return, the greatest opportunity, the most amount of wealth that's ever created are in these events. Mm-hmm. Is it if it's you know just the slow growth, again, you lower interest rates, you don't need a big return to you know for the premiums, there's not a lot of risk. But now, but if there's higher risk, higher volatil- volatility, those returns, potential returns, go way up, as do the potential losses. Yeah. The key is to try to quantify um, that risk as much as possible so you can mitigate it and insulate yourself. Yeah. And, and that's what multifamily is a great asset class just inherently to do that with. Um, but it's how do you navigate um, this period of time? And then and then how I, I do believe that there's going to be a window of great opportunity, but it's going to be a relatively short window. Yeah. So you don't want to get trapped catching a falling knife kind of before it. But you also have to be ready to go, ready to execute um, and be in the market, you can't be on the sidelines the whole time. Yeah, I, and and like you, we discussed this kind of the, for the past few weeks, really, about all the options for people that are yeah. that that may be getting into a bad situation. There's you know there's preferred equity, there's mm-hmm. mezzanine debt, there, tons of rescue capital there, out there, there like yeah. rescue capital, and then then you can talk with the banker who's probably not going to hate you. Yeah, if you've got a good, I mean, yeah, I would be definitely but, like keeping relationships. Yeah, but like even all of that, put that in a ball. The net effect of that is going to be it's, it's they're not going to get a better deal. They're going to get a worse deal. So it's probably yeah. going to make any potential yeah. sales price a little bit lower. The mm-hmm. question is a degree. And, you know, we may have people like uh, the 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 outfit that we were mentioning last time. We couldn't find a name for it. I think it was Tide Capital. Tide, Tide's equi- Tide yeah. Uh, or yeah, something Tide, like that. And um, there could be people like that. There could be. Uh, but I think that there's it's going to be a huge spectrum and it will be it'll be interesting. I again, like the reality of higher interest rates. It's hard 
it's hard to get around that. Yeah, but it's a, okay. If we think there's going to be a little more volatility for the next year or so, that means rates are going to be higher. Also, yeah. maybe they come down a little bit, but not not significantly. And I could even see them rise a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's even talk of the Fed funds rate getting up as high as six, which I don't, I don't, I don't think so. But yeah. you know, it's we're definitely not out of the woods yet. And again, it's have you set yourself up for success over the long term, or have you um, had more of a get rich quick mentality? Yeah. Um, which again higher risk, higher potential return. You flip a couple of deals very quickly, higher velocity of money. You can mm-hmm. theoretically make more money. You know, if you can get a two, simplest way to think about it, if you can get a two X over five years versus a three X over 10 years, well, if you do two, two X's, you get four versus yeah. three. But if you need something to occur in a shorter period of time, there's a much lower probability yeah. that you can make the, all those things happen. If you give yourself plenty of time, there's a lot of opportunities. Yeah, this to, is a key example of like, this is why short term is riskier. There is a risk yeah, that there's it, a run There's nothing inherently wrong. There's something, wrong. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if, really if you're point. looking for a lot of people when they think about investing in real estate, um, mm-hmm. I'd say they fall into two buckets. Some are very entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, opportunistic, and are, you know, a little bit of rolling the dice, you know, and it can be high risk, yeah. high reward. And then there's, I'm looking at real estate because it's a conservative investment. Um, and there's so many different ways to invest in real estate. Yeah. And the way we like to invest in real estate is let's not lose any money. Let's make good money over time. It's going to take a little while, um, but it's going to be worth it in the end. Yeah. And, and, and at the end, you look at the returns, the returns end up being higher than some of the shorter term strategies because some of the shorter term strategies fall mm-hmm. or even the higher risk non real estate strategies like like a VC fund or other PE funds where they're like, yeah, they're maybe they're going to get a 25 X on one of their deals, you know, on one out of 10, but nine mm-hmm. out of 10 went to zero. Yeah. And so the average, like they're like, well, we got a 17% IRR and I'm like, sweet. We got a 30 on a multifamily yep. deal and we did it on mo- almost most of almost all of them. Yeah. You know, so, um, multifamily is in a sweet spot, but you're, it's going to take the right operators through the right people and being in the, the right markets um, to kind of navigate, I think, over this next period. But I mean, for all the all the doom and gloom and you know, it's looking bad, I mean, this just means there's going to be awesome deals yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that's what I keep hearing from other buyers is they're like, no, we're looking, we're, we're ready for deals. Like no one is saying yeah. multifamily is dead. Mm-hmm. People, office, people are <laughs> yeah. it's not dead. People are like, no, no, one's, no one's buying office buildings right yeah. now. So yeah. let's get into this uh, CPI report. Actually, look at the. Uh, All right. Yeah. Let's look, look at the numbers oh. you know, before it gets too late in the day, Matt. <laughs> um, you know, because, um, again, yeah, higher inflation. Matt, what were some of your takeaways um, can you compare to last um, month? And, and OK, so not like amazing like last month, not horrible either. A, a year over year inflation is still trending down from 6.4 to 6.3 this month. Uh, the month over month change is 0.5, which is actually mu- much higher than the 0.1 percent monthly change for the previous month. We're still trending downward for the year, but it's going to be bumpy. I don't think that it ever was. Everyone's going to be linear. There's always going to be, you know, little variations. Variations. I am uh, I am calmed by the over the, by the relative decline. But then again, like if we kept having zero point five for the whole year, that'd be a lot. You, you know that'd be a lot. Um, so that's almost like what six percent. Yeah, six percent over the year. So we don't want that. The target's two. I don't know if we'll ever get to two, but still, yeah, um, it means I, I was looking at this. <laughs> I, I probably as as a lot of multifamily investors do in terms of what does this mean for interest rate hikes? And um, you look at the flower and prepared. Flower mixes. Oh man. Well, okay. Zero six. Well, oh, that's kind of weird. It's a deal. Oh, 20. Oh my goodness. It's a deal. Yeah. On flour and prepared flour mixes. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get it. <laughs> anyway, let's go get on it. Um, the, uh, I did look at the eggs index or what amounts yeah. to it, which is at a mind boggling 70.1. We had some complaints. We did not talk about eggs as much. Oh, well, well, I, you know, maybe we can have a special video just all about eggs and, and how. Uh, you know, okay. So I actually, I wanted to mention something. I yeah. I, I've been seeing like eggland eggs advertisements oh yeah they are like pushing eggs harder now during this period it's a shortage but they're like they're like no no no. you need eggs go buy your eggs everyone's oh, wow. talking about eggs you can't get them everybody wants what you can't get yeah and yeah i don't know they've Profit got some mar- I, I, yeah, yeah they got some good margins right now they're exploiting <laughs> but i thought it was interesting that i'm like i i've only seen so many egg commercials in my day yeah true that's so. true the incredible edible egg that's classic um but it, they were up oh, the uh, the month over month increase was only a le- uh 
only uh, 8.5%, which followed 11.1% eggs monthly increase. Still expensive, those eggs, um, but maybe... Fresh fish that. also, you know, just keeps going up. Well, and that's actually the takeaway. So last last month, actually, it seemed like groceries, which is food at home, I think is how they kind of phrase it in yeah. the CPI. Uh, groceries weren't really uh, growing at, at the same. They weren't really going crazy. But but this year, um, groceries in general it, is up 11.3% year over year. Prices actually wow. really spiked by 0.8% last month compared to 0.4% the month before. Um, I and think this is important because this is like the money that's left over or not left over to pay rent. Yeah. And I think like, yeah, you can core this out and say, and like there is a core because food and, and energy and gas are, are more volatile. The people always use the core inflation to say, actually, inflation is like this and this. But that's people's experience of inflation. People are buying groceries and putting gas in yeah. the tanks. So. so like psychologically, yeah, that's going to, that means a lot. It, it, it makes sense from looking at a macroeconomic perspective mm-hmm. to yeah. see generally how mm-hmm. things are going. But for the actual what the how the consumer is feeling on and yeah higher frequency basis it makes sense and how many complaint calls are going into to Jay Powell he probably has reception is probably flooded with eggs calls please help us do well, you think he, yeah I, I'm sure he has a, <laughs> I, I had to be one of those things that, that I wouldn't be surprised maybe he doesn't have a secretary or yeah assistant. yeah he just answers all the emails personally <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. um anyway the so uh, but but for more for like the multifamily side, um, the shelter is still high. Um, we're almost there. We're maybe one, two months away, two CPI reports away from the one year anniversary of the interest rate increases from the Federal Reserve. Um, so this is a significant milestone because interest rate movements typically take about 12 months to show up in the CPI's measurement of shelter inflation. And this is about uh, a year, so it would, and I think if you measure market rents, it's about we're about a year away from peak market rents before they started yeah. sliding as well. Matt, do, did um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but did they did they increase the weighting of shelter and CPI recently from last month? Because I, th- I thought it was like I thought it was like 33. Now it's 34.4 on this graph. Did yeah, they, did they, sure. they switch that around on a monthly basis? Yeah, I, I, I have no idea. I'd I, like I, to I, know. We should let's pop over yeah. and, and, and look at last month because I'm, I'm almost certain that shelter was. I know it was a third, but I thought it was like 31 or 32, 33. I don't. I don't. We'll, we'll, we'll find out, but it's yeah. even a larger share of CPI, which is part of the story. Because mm-hmm. you know, if CPI is it's over a third is shelter, and their gauge to measuring shelter is a inc- incredibly lagging. Yeah, um, you know, and, and I, I've actually um, been hearing more from financial reporters, inc- including like the Bloomberg's and CNBC's. Mm-hmm. They've started taking like adjusting by taking shelter out. Well, and I, I was because they've all acknowledged they listened to the Gray Report. <laughs> That's right. One of the only um, long, longer takes that I that I saw as I was scanning the radio waves to hear takes on CPI was uh, Pro- Pro- Professor Fe- Siegel from the Wharton School talked. To, uh, he had his own special formula yeah. that included like market rents and and he and he had inflation decreasing because in, because apartment rents it. have have stagnated or really gone down. And wouldn't some, that be a different story that everyone would be talking about? Yeah, and and but. I mean, like to kind of go back to it, and, and we've talked about this before. And the way CPI measures rents, these are rents as experienced by everyone paying. It's not; it doesn't take in, in mind the decisions that they're making about rent, which would which which is like market rents. Yeah. It just takes about like what's the burden on people's. So this is a view of the burden on people's wallets, but but it doesn't it doesn't really reflect where the market is at. Um. So I yeah. we would I, I think everyone would really love a kind of an alternative. You know, maybe there's another core version or something that we that we can look at. But. Yeah, it's it's certainly in the, in the lexicon, and, and even the Federal Reserve put out of the whole uh, white paper about you know, yeah, different yeah. ways to cal- so they calculate. Know, so, I mean, yeah, it's know. there. I think that they're relatively self aware. But um, yeah, so I'm sorry for the specific numbers. It's shelter inflation is up 7.9 percent year over year and 0.7 percent month over month, which is the same as last month, which also saw a 0.7 percent monthly increase. The rent rent of primary residence is up eight point six percent year over year and like overall shelter had a monthly increase of 0.7 percent this month compared to 0.7 percent last month we're not out yet um again like 
it lags about a year, maybe 13 months from like market rents, and uh, and we're we are approaching that threshold really quickly. And I think this is that this is also something that I noted in uh, in in my notes about uh, renewal rents as well. So you know we'll we'll see where this where this comes from, but uh, we're going to see a little bit of a changed market like very quickly because as high as rents went up, that's you know that's kind of how. Yeah, Quickly, you know, I think just in context again, if the conversation was about if we had a negative CPI with you know a more accurate um, calculation of shelter, yeah, um, it, we just the conversation would be completely different. Mm -hmm. um, but and and not necessarily for the downside. I think it actually may be better and paint a more accurate picture because then it would be. Um, less concerning of like inflation is out of control mm -hmm. and well, rents are actually getting a little bit cheaper. It's a little bit easier on individuals. Yeah. Gas is a little bit cheaper. And then it's like, well, then maybe the Fed can't, maybe not they're going to lower rates, but maybe it's, you can see that picture come into clear view of more of a plateau and normalization. And then, you know, who knows what, you know, when they're yeah. going to dial it down, you know, over time when they feel very comfortable. One year. <sighs> It's either going to be, you know, like kind of what they did, you know, taper tantrum, mm -hmm. post GFC, and then they're feeling good enough, and then they try and people freak out, maybe, or, um, well, that was kind of that was that was the opposite of they started raising started raising rates actually, but it's you know people are going to it's either going to happen gradually, lower it down over time, ease it off, or crisis. Usually, yeah. it's crisis. Yeah, that's what they want. Bring them down to zero, mm -hmm. and they've got plenty of ammunition. Like if they want to simulate the economy. They got plenty of ammo. I mean, the concern prior was like, what they, where are they going to lower it from? They yeah. don't have any, any room to lower. Yeah. They got plenty of room. Yeah, that's true. And and like, it's depressing looking at the chart of federal funds rate. It's like, it's either at high or zero. They're either shooting for the moon or they're going yeah. underground. There's not, uh, yeah. I'd like a little bit of like, can we feather the accelerator a little uh, bit? Some feathering would be nice, like in uh, a lot of throttle. And, and, yeah. and the cons so, you know, think through this, you know, the concern would be if there's a crisis, you know, you can turn the housing market back on in a second by lowering the lowering those rates. Mm -hmm. But if you actually haven't stamped out inflation and you're blowing oxygen yeah. on the fire or pouring jet fuel on the fire, all of a sudden you yeah. can get a you know a flare up, and uh, all of a sudden you could have um, rampant inflation all mm -hmm. of a sudden when when you thought that you had tampered it down. So that's the concern, and I think they are going to be a little. We're always fighting the last war, right? Yeah. So I think they're going to be a little gun shy on the next crisis. Um, but, um, yeah, that'll be, that'll be really only interesting. time will tell. Hopefully that's not for a while and things are relatively smooth sailing, which yeah. I, I, I frankly think, you know, I think again, there's going to be some volatility. Um, but I, I think we're going to, it's the right. bumps that make, give me a little bit more confidence than this, like streamline. If, if people were super eager to keep spending and like things go, are really going great. We don't have any bad signals. That makes me worry a little bit, but if there and, are, and still there maybe is a, there's a little bit. I think it's relatively balanced. There's some of that going on, mm -hmm. but not people enough. are talking also about like the idea of like a rolling recession uh -huh. or something. And certain industries are having layoffs, and then you know certain you know, there are certain areas that are doing better than others. And that maybe I would I would definitely like that than a wholesale recession that's caused by you know this kind of all or nothing. You'd think that there there's maybe some more thoughtfulness. Yeah. And, but it, it's even hard, and 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 I think that it's appropriate that we're in some kind of rolling economic. Period. Yeah, which we always, always kind of are, you know, always transitioning yeah. from one place to the other. But yeah, you know, we're Matt, we're we're transitioning, mm -hmm. but um, we just got we have to get through it, get to the other side. Yeah, yeah, and um, take it one day at a time. Yeah, uh, yeah, decisions. we had to listen we, to the great report. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> which you can subscribe to the Great Capital YouTube channel. You get updates all the time. The mm -hmm. newsletter. If you're not signed up for the Great Capital newsletter, hop on over to greatcapitalllc.com slash newsletter. Um, up to updated every week. Yep. That's great. Um, I digress. Continue, man. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of was my uh, was my summative comments. Really, uh, we're still we still are burning off those those uh, market rate increases uh, that we saw a year ago. They're still recording the CPI. Core inflation is up five point six percent year over year and point six percent month over month. Really, um, we're we're troubledly normal. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be. It's not great if it was, it, but it is definitely not horrible. And like that's how it might. Be in 2023, and, and and sometimes maybe we just all have to tell ourselves, guys, it's it's okay, yeah, we're fine with the way it is, and mm -hmm. rates are going to be a little bit higher, and we're going to have to make do. Yeah, like again, I heard a real estate investors say, hey, you know, 
we were able to figure out deals in the 90s when rates, you know, cap rates were yeah. six and seven and then interest rates were, you know, six and seven. So mm-hmm. or cap rates could have even, were even higher in the eights. So interest rates are higher before that. People did deals. So it's just if they look different, get used to it. Mm-hmm. You know, cheese has moved and that's right. Accommodate accordingly. Exactly. Um, Matt, if we're all finished with CPI. Oh, totally. Yeah, let's dive in. Sure. Okay. But uh, you already matrix, National Multifamily Family Report. And there is a familiar market on the oh, front that cover page um it's the uh, it's a familiar skyline to us matt actually <laughs> kind of looking out the window we can sort of see it yeah. um but uh oh, i'm this over but indianapolis once again um top market for rent growth and um you don't have to go to the sun belt to experience some solid um growth matt i think that i think that's the takeaway yeah. a couple weeks ago we got the uh we got the monthly reports from apartment list and we all and i'm also going to use this uh use this report in line with uh, with a Redfin report uh, for yeah. for monthly rent as well to give us a little more context, maybe make these numbers a little more robust. Um, but either way, starting with Yardy Matrix, they recorded five point five percent year over year rent growth and flat month over month rent growth in January, which is a slight improvement over the slight decline in December's rent um, numbers for month month over month. Uh, Redfin actually put year over year rent growth at only 2% and their monthly rent growth, which they don't list outright. And I had to do some math to calculate their monthly, their month over month rent growth is at a negative 1.9%. Actually, they may list it. I think I did needless math. I'm uh, sorry, on the Redfin? Yeah, the, yeah, they did. They did list it. I just did math for no reason. But, yeah. um, <laughs> anyways, Redfin has big swings. Their peak year over year rent growth was 17.5% in early 2022, which, is, which compares to uh, 15.3% for Yardy Matrix in February 2022. But back to Redfin, they do have some good market information. Their top markets are, and then I'm just going to buzz through these as quick as I can, Raleigh, uh, Raleigh North Carolina at 22.5%, Cleveland at 17.5%, Indy at 14.9%, Charlotte 14.2%, Nashville 98 Kansas City 88 Um, Their worst performers were Phoenix at negative 67 Oklahoma City negative 63 New Orleans negative 5.2, Minneapolis, negative 5.1, Houston, negative 4.9, Baltimore, negative 4.6. All of these negative numbers, um, they're, and, and going back to Yardy Matrix, they don't have specific numbers for their for the, for the their markets, um, but none of them are negative. It, it, again, big swings for, for Redfin, not as big of a swing for, for Yardy Matrix. Um, Anyways, uh, in terms of their list of the, of the top markets, they have Indianapolis as the top at above 10%. Then there's a fall off really considerably until you get to San Jose, which is at 8% rent growth, followed by Miami at a little under 8 and then the rest are kind of clustered around 7.5, um, which these are markets like Kansas City, Raleigh, Charlotte, and Chicago. Really? Agreement? In general, with Redfin, just the swings are different. Yeah. Yep. Um, their worst performers on this list are um, is starts with Las Vegas, which may be like 0.5 percent rent growth, um, and then Phoenix, and then a big jump to 2.5, around 2.5 percent rent growth for places like Baltimore, Sacramento, Atlanta, and the Twin Cities. Again, like decent agreement, but the amplitude is way stronger for the Redfin data. I'm not sure if amplitude's the right word, but definitely the waveform is a little bit more squiggly if you were to plot these out on, yeah, on a graph. Yeah. yeah. Bigger swings. Um, and, but to kind of shift back to Yardy Matrix, their summary of relevant economic con- conditions really kind of jibes with what we were saying. Um, if anything, is a little bit more positive. They uh, referenced the recent strong jobs report. They don't. They didn't factor CPI in because it wasn't written yet. That's fine. <laughs> well, that's why you can't get a report. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> even considering th- they, th- I'm sorry, they referenced the strong jobs report such that even considering the possibility of higher interest rates, they say, quote, early data indicates solid evidence for a multifamily soft landing in 2023. Um, I mentioned before that you know, from April 2008 to August 2022, the federal funds rate was below 2.5%. Yeah. Uh, that's like a little over 14 years. That's a long time for people's memories to change and their expectations to change. I don't think that we've seen the full impact of higher interest rates on the mentality of buyers and sellers. But like you said, there are people around that have done deals in higher interest rates. So. Yeah, but but not necessarily with lower cap rates. And, yeah. and, that, and that's, that's where the, the the gap is, the chasm is, yeah. is because you, know, you saw some sellers who are like, oh, I, you know, it needs to be under five. And then you've got buyers who are like, it needs to be close to six. I mean, the, the buyers are at six and mm-hmm. the sellers are, you know, four and a half to five. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's it's so that kind of mid five range is who's on the seller side, who's willing to come up 
come down in price up in cap rate and on the yeah. buy side who's willing to maybe come down a little bit in cap rate up in price yeah um and i it, it there's still a, a wide gap again yeah. I mean, it's a hundred basis point gap between buyers and sellers that's a good at point maybe on what they think it should be maybe the people with with the experience are the ones that are like listen you guys gotta get comfortable with these change numbers yeah 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 it, it's a lot of um a lot of education, I think, on the mm -hmm. broker side, and also uh, a little bit of counseling you know, on the emotional. Yeah. Oh, emotion, yeah, for sure. Because I mean, these guys, you know, especially if you um, had a good project, again, like you maybe you just develop something and delivered it, and mm -hmm. like it's you've got a loan coming due, you got a balloon yeah. payment, you got to do something, and it, it you've in even. If you've got a an assets in a good position and, and now you wanted to hold on to it, but now all of a sudden it's like, no, we may have to sell it now because we have to put a permanent loan on and at a rate that we would not crazy about and hold on to for a couple of years with the prepayment. Yeah. 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 Um, Matt, do you mind looking at the um, rent to income ratios? Oh, totally. Yeah. Again, I, I was like looking at this and I'm really glad you already tracks it. And um, Matt, you, you, you actually pinpointed a couple of... Um, minor calculation errors discrepancies in a previous report let you already know they've <laughs> they've, they've they have since fixed that yeah. they said oh yep we missed it um so we're trying to keep them on their toes a little bit um but you know again 30 percent is kind of your average for you know 30 percent of rent to income ratio is the typical national standard and you know consider anything over that is considered rent burdened um, and not surprisingly, some of the markets that are more rent burdened over 30 percent, um, you know, at the top Orange County, California, um, you know, San Francisco, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Sacramento, Orlando, New York, Inland Empire, Los Angeles. So those are kind of the you know, pricey metros, a lot of stuff in the middle, right at 30. But then down here at the bottoms, so this is, I think, one just in general, more affordable metros. Um, so lower rents, you're going to see some probably some lower median incomes on average. And also a lot of these markets, um, this is, isn't necessarily to their advantage, but the housing markets in general are a little bit more affordable. You can actually yep. buy a home, you know, in, in Kansas city and in Indianapolis and in Cleveland, Ohio and Columbus, Ohio, that gap between rents and mortgage payments isn't as drastic. Yep. Um, so there's a little bit more competition still on the for sale market, but I mean, Kansas city. I mean, um, overall, you know, 22.6%, um, I believe is those, so that's lifestyle, all units, they're at 24.6, Indianapolis is 25.8. Those are the two lowest, right? Those are the two lowest. Yeah. 24.6, um, and then 25.8 for Kansas city and Indianapolis respectively. And then San Jose, California, surprisingly, so, you know, that, California City, other markets in California are pretty expensive, but it San Jose is 25.9. It didn't used to be like this specifically, but it is right now. Those are the leaders. The, what, Those uh, are the leaders. The affordability, Jardim, flight to affordability. Yeah, I, I think. And it also implies that there's even more room. It's not like things are getting less affordable in a relative way for these markets that are at the bottom. I was I would be expecting if if Indianapolis got to be like a in a bad situation, I would expect that number of rent to income yeah. to start creeping up in the list. But so, it's not so I'll give the counter argument to the Midwest and in a market like Indianapolis. You yeah. know, we're usually promoting it because that's where we're from. We have, that's where we do a lot of deals. But you know, so here here's the counter argument to a lot of that. I already mentioned that home prices are more affordable. Yeah. Um that's a good point. But you know we're you you could look at it as oh India India Indy and Kansas City we're, we're we're really outpacing a lot of these other markets. Another way to look at it is we're catching up. Mm -hmm. um, is that we didn't see as much rent growth in the past, so are, are we stayed affordable and now we're just catching up a little bit. Um, so it's all, I guess, your frame of reference and what period yeah. you're in. I, I think you could look at it as saying, you know, that the Midwest is a little bit of, is a lagging indicator and that we can use other markets that are more leading indicators to give some insight. Um, you know, in, in it doesn't just have to be in real estate. It's a lot of trends in general. I mean, mm -hmm. you could look at, again, this, from someone that's from the Midwest and I've lived in um, I lived in New York, in New York City, and, and I've lived in South Florida. You can see things that are happening like in New York. Like yeah. pop restaurant ideas, concepts, and whatever it yeah. is, entertainment style of, of what whatever the trend is, economic. Um, usually, there's a delay before until it gets to the Midwest. Yeah, yeah. And so there's like an arbitrage of information or ideas. Um, but you know, you can. There are some other areas where there's a, a little bit more of a leading indicator. You can see what is to come. 
Um, so are we leading or are we just catching up? You yeah. know, I, I think that at the end of the day, it's, you know, when you get in, how you get in, what's your basis, yeah. what you do with it. But uh, yeah. just, just I want to put that counterpoint just because we're always talking about how great the Midwest is. And um, it's much less volatile. And when others go down, it stays stable. And when things go up, it goes up, too, but maybe not as much. Um, I think that it it is there's more upside than people give it credit mm -hmm. for. Um, but yeah, no, but there's some higher return markets out there, but it's again, risk equals return. Yeah. Just coming back to that. Yeah. I think that uh, that was just my point is like, I think it just implies maybe that there is some room to grow. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, and, and, and again, just another, just another counterpoint against the Midwest, Matt, let's look, um, at, um, employment growth, job, job growth, you know, mm -hmm. job growth is, um, something you really want to keep track of and completions as a, as a percentage of total stock is also important. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, let's look at a San Jose at 5.1%, you know, six month moving average of year over year job growth um, versus Indianapolis at 2.8. I mean, that that 5.1 in San yeah. Jose and the fact that it's affordable, that that's attractive. Um, they're also not building too many new apartments, 1.1% of a uh, so percent of com total stock. Yeah. Um, Indy is also very low, under percent, 0.9. Um, but again, job growth is 2.8. Um, so, I mean, San Jose, now you have to deal with some of the other issues of being in California, but maybe you don't have all the issues in San Jose as you do in a San Francisco or Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, now let's look at some other really big, let's look at some of the big job growth um, uh, markets. I mean, so we mentioned San Jose, Dallas, 6.8, not too surprising. Chicago, 4.1, Charlotte, 5.4, Kansas City, 1.6. Um, any other standouts here, Matt? Houston, 6.2. Um, I think is Dallas topping the list 6.8? Yeah, looks at, like it. I believe for sure. so. So not surprising. Dallas has been going gangbusters. I've been doing really well. Um, now, another thing just to, again, just to compare is that, again, the supply that's coming online, that's been highlighted as a major concern. I think most people who dig into it aren't overly concerned in the long term, more of the, over the short term. Um, let's see what, what stands out. In Miami Metro, 3.5%. That's not too surprising. They've got great rank growth and pretty good job growth. At, yeah, good job growth at 5.3%. Denver. Denver, um, 3.1%, oh, sorry, no, 3.8% of, of new um, completions as a percent of total stocks. So this isn't pipeline. This is just completion. What's yeah. actually been delivered, by the way. Um, 4.8 in Austin. Not surprised oh. there. Twins, see, oh, man. Minnesota, Twin Cities, 4.6. It, it just, you know, Minneapolis has had a rough time the past couple of years. Yeah. So, so we have this is a good that's a good like right right down the line austin you've got third or what three percent uh or i'm sorry 5.5 percent job growth and then 4.8 percent coming online and then twin cities you have three point about two percent less uh job growth and then you you have 0.2 percent less you have virtually the same amount yeah and also less projected rent growth also or for uh, last year's rent growth and then forecasted as well. Even yeah, it's lower. So, yeah, Minneapolis. I mean, yeah, Twin Cities was on was you know both Redfin and Yardy kind of agreed mm -hmm. agreed with that uh, with those rent growth assessments. I also we got to talk about occupancy, man. Yeah, occupancy has been coming down. Um, you've had you know people are finally moving out. Some mm -hmm. people are moving in with roommates, and you know we have seen some drops in occupancy for sure. I mean, we're looking at maybe not a full hundred basis points. But um, we're, we're, we're approaching that pretty soon. Yeah, I'd like to know what the long term average is compared to comp kind of this current movement because things really pinched. 94.5%. Okay. Or okay. 95. Yeah. 95 yeah. is what you shoot for. 95 is generally the average. It's probably a little bit below 95. Okay, average. I wonder Depending, if we, That's national average. I wonder if we get there. I don't, I don't know. I think it, it, it seems to reason that we would still stay elevated because we're still. But, have a shortage but of homes. The point is, we're still occupancy is still above now. Yeah, that's averages. what. I'm, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But but again, this comes to the fact of you know. Okay, so you 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 were buying an apartment last year. What were your assumptions when you were buying it? You bought it when it was 100 percent occupied. Mm -hmm. What did you model in for your occupancy? Maybe you know conservatively, 95 would is typically considered considered to be aggressive. Usually, like mm. 90, 92 is a good like assumption. You know, for because okay. 95 icing on top but let's say you're like hey no it's 100 percent we're not it, it's been 98 to 100 over the last two years in a crazy market 
let's model in 96% occupancy. Totally mm-hmm. reasonable. A lender will certainly sign off on it. You mm-hmm. Give them the financials. It's been occupied. Sure, checks the box. We've got the financials to back it up. So you, you're, mark, you, you're assuming higher occupancy. You're assuming double digit rent growth. You're assuming cap rate compression. Yeah. And you're you're assuming supply costs and labor costs to be X and your property taxes to be Y and your utilities. But all of your expense and not but what ended up happening is all of your expenses ended up being a third more. Mm-hmm. Like across the board. Your rent growth is a fraction if you have any rent growth. Cap rates have gone up, so your valuation is screwed up for your refinance, and all of a sudden you're ninety three percent occupied instead of the ninety six or ninety eight. Yeah, like you, like if you if you people were just pricing and modeling the deals for absolute perfection because they'd been operating in yeah. a perfect way since COVID happened, and it seemed like magic. I mean, it was, yeah. I mean, everyone was, it was, it literally felt like magic. It's like the whole Bully family world is supposed to be crumbling right now back in May of 2020. Mm-hmm. And then um, then we're like, you know, looking at the data and seeing where we are, and we're like, no, we're 100% everywhere, and yeah. everyone's paying. Yeah, yeah. What? And and, and, and then and, and then it's like the, the comps across the street just rose rents by 15 percent. Well, and see, and I'm thinking like on the other side, like if I'm an investor and I'm looking at like an operator, if I'm looking to invest with with someone and they're giving me their model. I don't know how how much I'm going to inter- I, I well, most, trust. A lot of people don't even look at look. I mean, they don't even get the model. But I but but like I think that the but like just knowing from it, like it, it makes sense. Like, OK, what what do you think is going to happen to this property? Are you assuming that it's always going to be rented up. What's your worst case scenario? It's probably a really well, good. And I think also LPs don't want to like how much do you, you there's the time appropriate times to push back when but when you have like a certain amount of knowledge. But yeah, typically like an LP isn't sometimes they are nor, more knowledgeable than the sponsor. But a lot of times they're like, well, I know enough to be dangerous. I know enough that I want to mm-hmm. invest in this asset class. But like, am I an absolute expert at Excel in finance in financial models? Mm-hmm. Like you don't have to be an expert in financial models to invest in real estate. Like if you know a little bit about financial modeling, it'll certainly help well, you. I'm just thinking like what would be the right questions that investors can ask and, and without getting into like the nerdy details that are boring. <laughs> but what are the right, you know, ask them maybe what's your worst case scenario and what's a typical worst case scenario? Is your worst case scenario this year a lot different yeah, than it was I, a year and a half ago? I think I think that's along the right line of questioning is talking about the stress testing Yeah. of, um, you know, how is this being stress tested? You know, what happens in these different um, situations, these different scenarios? Um, and you don't have to be an expert mm-hmm. um, to say, well, what, what if you get no rent growth this year? Can, can you show me a model with no rent growth or 3% rent growth instead of your 15% rent growth? Yeah, yeah. Um, or I see here we're on a floating rate loan, but you have, it seems like your interest rate is kind of fixed um, at 5%. Um, can you model it at 7%? Mm-hmm. Um, or can you provide me a sensitivity matrix of you know, yeah, different yeah. cap rates and NOIs or exit year and, and cap rates? Um, or, you know, what what's the break even occupancy on this? Yeah. Or and even better yet, um, well, those are really good. But, you know, w- what's your biggest concern for this deal? How, t- tell me how yeah. this deal goes wrong. And, and if they have a if they can't answer that or saying, oh, no, it's all good. I can't imagine it like they should be like any deal. The perfect deal. I, you can paint. I can paint you a picture how it goes wrong. Yeah. There's always yeah. a possibility things go wrong, even when deals work out the majority of the time. Like I can show you how things go wrong. I we I we here this we screw up. We screw up really bad. We make mm-hmm. all these mistakes. It results in this occupancy drops. Rents go rent goes down. You know, the lender takes the, the, the property away for like show you the dots how it gets there we'll now we'll do everything to prevent that from yeah. happening um but you know there's every no business plan's perfect yeah no plan's yeah. perfect otherwise everybody would be doing it and mm-hmm. you know there'd be zero return on the deals because it'd be such a sure thing and you know it'd be like buying a buying a good old treasury bond why not yeah yeah i i, I do think that like and and a and a operator worth of salt and, and a like syndicator or, you know, someone worth of salt is going to be able to answer that worst case scenario question a lot more honestly than, yeah. uh, than someone that's. I mean, it's easy to say, like, at the end of the day, you need you you have to have a level of trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who you're investing with. But that's way that's so easy to say and harder to do. And yeah. you can have a good feeling about somebody and they can just be a not great operator or person. Yeah. Um, obviously, somebody you'd rather have somebody who's honest with you than um, 
than somebody who's gonna you know be dishonest and be be nefarious. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, you know, an honest person um, can also not be a good operator and still lose your money, and they'll be yeah, honest yeah. about yeah, <laughs> losing yeah, yeah. your money. That's true. <laughs> um, uh, I, I would prefer the person to be straight up, but you need to have somebody who's honest that's going to be just straight up and you know no nonsense and. Um, but also someone that is a group that's skilled, knows what they're doing, have the yeah. resources. And, and one thing to look at is, you know, how, how are interests aligned and disaligned? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, and, and the easiest way to align interest is, all right, I'm putting my money into the deal. How much of your actual cash are you putting into the deal? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and not and rolling in fees are, are, are definitely a good way to do that. Um, it's not as much skin in the game as like fresh dollars. I think, I, I think though, I mean, yeah. throwing fees is totally fine. And, a lot of times that's the only money cash sponsor has to roll in so you wouldn't eliminate someone just because of that but um it it, it becomes more difficult and the interests become more dis disaligned when the operators return and compensation is more s focused on capital events yeah. and the capital event in at, needing to happen a certain period of time rather than i've got cash in the deal and i'm going to get a return along the way yeah um and, and i'll give you just a real-time example of that you know we, we have a property that we bought a couple of years ago and I, I made a pretty decent size just investment in it personally and it's throwing off great cash flow and, and we talked about you know is it time to sell it is there some capex needs you know is it better to sell it or we you know make these investments and you know if i was just if i didn't have any money in the deal you know, I'd be like, well, I'm not going to make, I'm not going to get my big check until we sell it. Let's sell yeah. it. So, so the, your, your self-interest would say, let's, let's sell it. You yeah. know, if it's a good return investors, let's just sell it. And you can justify it. You justify that decision and be like, it's yeah. a good return for investors. Who's going to mm -hmm. complain? But all of a sudden you got money in the deal and I've got money in the deal. And so I'm thinking, yeah, it makes like, it a lot I'm like, more real. I'm like well, it, it's real. And I'm like, well, I like the cash flow. Yeah. And, and I like the cash flow for my investment. And that's what an investor is going to say. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't have that money, a substantial amount invested, and you're not getting like you're not feeling that cash flow every month it's, or every yep, quarter, yep. and so you, that that question doesn't even come into your mind. And so like even some guys on the team are like, I "Think we, maybe we should sell it?" And I'm like, "Maybe, but I'm not sure. I like yeah. the cash flow." Yeah. Well, and, and that's what I was going to say is like, you know, talking to these investors, maybe you could learn a, a thing or two too. Well, that's the thing. It's like, and I've talked to the investors, and they say they like the cash flow. Yeah. And they're like, we should hold on to it because I like the cash flow. Yeah. Now I'm like, well, if we explain to them we're going to spend some money, and, and you know, we can actually get a really good return, maybe it makes sense, and we can all be on the same page. But you can just see how quickly you can be, yeah, unaligned, and and, and it might be a still good thing for everyone. But, you know, is the, how is that sponsor going to just be thinking, you know, mm -hmm. what's the, what's the psychology and um, you can structure a deal in a way of where you just you're kind of forced to think a one way or the other. Yeah. So and you it's want true. it to be aligned and not have a situation where it's like, wow, it's just kind of naturally. Good, yeah. Yeah. Without even you like trying. Um, so, Matt, I heard you mention a conversation that I've been wanting to have mm -hmm. about inclusionary housing policies. So ramping up against affordability crisis now the affordability crisis near and dear to my heart you know it, it's again it's like the problem that we're trying to solve we're solving multiple problems here one you know people need high quality um housing that they can afford that's good safe really nice exceptional living experience also trying to make, create really great returns for investors and we're looking for the slice where both those things can happen yeah not one or the other um not mutually exclusive so uh, so this this resonates with me, but what what is this about, Matt? So and and this is something you'll have to add if I'm if I'm missing some of the definition here. But this is about inclusionary housing policies. And what what is inclusionary? So housing again, policies? Like, definitely correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, they mean that for developers, so under an, an inclusionary housing policy, developers that take part in the program, in a, an affordable housing program, need to set aside a specific proportion of units to individuals making X percent of the median oh, yeah. income for the area. Sure. Um, okay, so. Like LIHTC and. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and I think this is a really interesting policy because of how um, fine-tuned you could possibly get. Now, I'm not sure how it is in the execution. And a lot of what Moody's is saying is like, yeah, we need to keep track of these. It's like, yeah, I think so too. <laughs> 
Um, these policies are really gaining steam, though. That was the other really headline, is that within the past five years, the number of policies that have been adopted have uh, have almost doubled. As Moody's writes, and I thought this was a particularly good um Good passage here. It says that the data is mixed on b- both voluntary and mandatory inclusionary policy impacts. Affordable housing supply grew significantly in some localities, but not others. Incentives offered, um, incentives offered, and local market conditions seemingly dictate the success of such measures rather than whether the policies are mandatory or voluntary. Incentives like density bonuses, less commonly available, tax breaks provide the strongest incentive. Other factors that likely play a role in program success include market size, strength, and development costs. There's a lot of different things that you can do. Yeah. Um, and my and and Moody's actually does point to higher vacancies in class A is almost like to say, hey, there's room in these buildings. Let's let's put them in here. Yeah. No, and you know, it's kind of the best tool, um, you know, like light tech housing um, projects. It's like it's kind of the only tool, one of the only tools that we have to, you know, combat combating, um, you know, massive housing shortage and housing crisis. And I think it can be a big win-win for communities. But I think to their point, you know, um, there are not two, you know, uh, housing inclusive housing policies in markets that are the same and Mm -hmm. how the individual markets, it can be so local. It's like, it's, you know, county by county and, you know, district or township by township. Um, and it's, very much like, hey, let's work out a deal and we um, can we make it work. But uh, especially now um, and going forward, it, it's hard to pencil new development right now. The financing yeah. isn't there. And so you, without these programs of, uh, you know, tax credit development, mm-hmm. housing isn't going to get built and certainly not housing um, that is what is the most in demand. You know, yeah. We, like, yeah. you, you want to build the fanciest high, you, you can pencil like super luxury. Um, you know what the demand is. You know, who knows? Depending on what the economy is like, but like, there's a lot of people who you know don't want to spend twenty five hundred dollars a month. Yeah, um, yeah. But they also like would like a decent place to live. And the city's like, all right, um, you know, we'll hold off on tax. This thing that wouldn't, isn't going to get built. Hold off on your paying taxes for a couple of years, mm-hmm. ten years. They got to set aside some of these unit units, and sometimes, like sometimes, the, like the median rent that you would charge for the affordable units, if the median rent is high, you're still charging close to market rate anyway. Yeah. Um. Which then you're like, what's the point? But well, and that's what I'm. That's what's kind of interesting about yeah. this. And and like I've heard a lot about nimbyism and yimbyism. I think yeah. these policies work on a different level. It's almost like what, like they'll argue against an apartment complex going up like close to someone um and, but then but beyond that it's gonna but but like after that that's when these kind of uh conversations get so after you know after we decided that this apartment who's gonna live in there and i think that you could if you were at the pol- so i'm sorry to, to backtrack i think that you could re- get really creative with the policies and sketch out a solution um and in like a situation where you're alleviating affordabilities in a way that is not disruptive to the like the more sensitive sensitive NIMBY voices. So these people that don't want, you know, people don't like change. People don't want their neighborhood transformed. Well, there's a lot of kind of fine tuning. For instance, you could play, and this is at the policy making stage, and I don't know whether these policies are dealt with deal by deal or not, but but you could play with things like maybe it's 50% of the median income or maybe it's 75% yeah, no, of the median they, income. They, yeah, they absolutely do that. Yeah. And also, yeah. like, what about the... Um, what about the area that you're measuring? Is it going to be like a quarter mile, a half mile, market yeah. wide? Um, well, you- and I think that's the thing. It's like every, all so much of this is all local. You know, well, I mean, light tech's one thing, but then some of the specific, like you know, whether it's TIF TIF district or yeah. different types of tax abatements. Okay, yeah, that that's where it's like. Very deal specific. And like, are you going to put them all? Are you going to put them all in like the bad, the the poorly constructed units? Are these going to be comparable units within the same yeah, with same construction? Are, are they going to be distributed throughout? And it's like, there's a lot. It, it, but I think it's a, a the dicey decision is, is going to be like who qualifies for these and how and how each neighborhood responds. We know. I know a bunch of people. We, we just bring. So let's bring a light tech developer on. I know. Yeah. half a dozen of them. Um, because I, I think that you know people don't people 
don't like their neighborhood changing, but I think that this this idea of it's like it's like a blending blending, and you could make it so that it doesn't look seem like your neighborhood's changing. It well, just seems like it's the deal. You know, the the deal, mm -hmm. or, and that's what that is. That's what the um right back there. Yeah, um, yeah. It's inclusionary. There's I mean, a deal. It's, it's the deal it's right near our office. Thirty percent is set aside for um, those making. I forget what the percentage of AMI is. But, yeah, um, and, but it looks like a really. I mean. And it's really nice, A class, cool. And and like asset. this, I also think that like, it could be really transformative because you're living in the same building as as other. You're sharing this community, yeah. and yeah. it could be there's some in, real income so demographics. Yeah, yeah there good. could be some real social benefits to this. That uh, that I don't think that it, it's a bad thing to live around different kinds of people and different perspectives. Um, but that but again, like NIMBY people, it's it's not like they're loud voices for nothing, and there is a real urge. To, it's like there's well, fear. Nimb Nimbies would be like, I think that people should live in mixed demographic you know, communities, but just not, no, my, yeah, not, not here. Yeah. I believe in it, but not when it we comes should to do me. that. But like, this is not the place for that. Yeah. I, and and ultimately, though, you I I like to think that this is less disruptive because we're already building it and you're going to choose to rent there. And and I don't I don't think that these places do they have to advertise like, oh, you're going to be living next. You, you you're never going to know the income of your neighbors. So it should not matter. Yeah. Um, but then again, I don't know. Um, my point really is that there's room within these policies to be more or less disruptive. And I wonder, like Moody's is, is calling for more information on this stuff. And my uh, and what I'd like more information is, are the more aggressive inclusionary policies more effective at alleviating mm -hmm. affordable housing? Like, don't don't worry about the NIMBYs. Don't try to appease them. Let's just let's just solve this yeah. affordable. Or do they incur more resistance such that less aggressive inclusionary policies are the way to go? Um, I, I think that the concept in general is like, it seems it makes perfect sense. Yeah. Rather than building a whole building that that people see as affordable housing as like as dangerous or fearful and totally changing landscape, you build something and you kind of integrate in a in a more thoughtful way. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of opportunities for that. And there's some really cool developers that are taking a lot of that into account and doing some really fascinating projects. The problem is there's not enough of these tax credits to go yeah. around. Um, I mean, here in Indiana, I mean, actually, you know, they there's like hardly any, any available. Like mm -hmm. a bunch got like allocated for like a not like for some project that's like not really going to be very impactful. Like there's like nothing available right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. You know, in this last ominous bill um, that the Congress passed back just before the end of the 2022, um, there's talked of a big affordable housing push for a lot more funding for light tech, you know, um, housing construction didn't make it in. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, this is it. This is the kind of the tool that we have, and it's not a bad. It's it's. Is it a perfect tool? Probably not. But it's like not. It's a pretty damn good tool. Yeah. And that's like shown to have good success. And at the end of the day, we like we have to build a lot more housing that yeah. uh, people can afford to live in. And so like the idea that um, you know we 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 wouldn't be doing doing more of that for mm -hmm. the, all the benefits of an economy that constructing housing you know provides yeah yeah um you know it's a little um mind-boggling but you know you start thinking about why the federal government or governments do what they do and i mean it's all a little mind-boggling so yeah. but that's just the state of things and people and time yeah for all I, time. i'm glad this is getting more attention that more of these policies are, are yeah, coming out yeah, there i agree and and i think that like it doesn't it, you're going to make someone mad and and no matter what and this seems like a really good way to try out all these different ways to make the least amount of people mad yeah i i i i agree i i agree there's there's relatively bipartisan support for like this type of housing yeah. so matt great discussion we need to pick this up and do the deeper dive yeah i agree um, and i'd love to have someone on, on yeah talk about um i've got a couple of really good ideas of folks cool Got stuff in the works on the Gray Report. Really exciting things. You know, make sure you're going to GrayReport.com. It's the number one multifamily intelligence aggregator on the net. Um, whether it's Yes Jeeves or whoever, always <laughs> always at the top. Um, but again, love for you to subscribe. It would mean a lot to us. Always leave it. We've been getting more comments, and, and you, know, Matt, and I are like, "Do you see the comments?" So and, you know, we we're responding. So we, we really appreciate it. Um, keep leave comments share this with your friends whether that's on your drop us in your linkedin um i'd love to see that and um again lastly if you're like I, I think these guys are worth having a conversation with um i'd like to do a deal with them we would be open to talking to you if you're an accredited investor 
Um, we, we, we always have something we're working on. I mean, the pipeline is, we've got a lot of opportunities that are um, in the hopper. Um, but again, like we were talking about earlier, it's, it's a interesting time. So we're, we're being pretty cautious, but, uh, at the same time we're, we're locked and loaded, ready to go, you know, we're trying to get as many commitments, um, in the gray fund. So when these opportunities drop, we can just pull the trigger. We're not saying, oh, let's get started and start having conversations because that window is going to close. Yeah. So if you want to take advantage of that window, um, you can go to gray.fun, graycapitalllc.com. You know how to get in touch with us. There's probably links in the description right here. So Matt, great report, great episode. Thank you all for watching this episode of The Gray Report. Stay tuned for next week's episode and have a good time in between now and then. <laughs>